In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. We all need a star by which to sail. Sailors navigate using the North Star. Sometimes they have the North Star as a tattoo. Navigating by the North Star is how they stay on course and how they find their way back to port if they burn off course and back home. They look to the North Star. Now our North Star is Jesus Christ in this church. We look to him as we try and navigate the boat. We call St. Mary Magdalene through the waves and the currents and the storms of our confused contemporary culture. Our North Star is Jesus Christ. For Jesus Christ is wisdom. That's what our second lesson, a spectacular passage from St. Paul's letter to the Colossians teaches us. This passage is one of the very first and one of the very greatest poems ever written about Jesus. It presents a vision of wisdom. Jesus is wisdom. And breathtakingly, it gives wisdom a human face, the face of the man Jesus Christ. He is the image of God, it says, the invisible one, firstborn of all creation. In him, all things were created. For in him, all the fullness was glad to dwell. Now this poem draws, as you may have noticed, on an ancient Jewish tradition of reverence for wisdom. Of course, that's why it's paired this morning with our first reading from the book of Proverbs about wisdom as God's delight. The book of Proverbs taught that it's by the power of this delight in wisdom that God created the world. And St. Paul says, that God is now active in remaking the world, restoring it, healing it, renewing it. And that the means by which he's done the first and doing the second is the person, the man we know as Jesus Christ. That's how he's made the world, that's how he's renewing the world, remaking the world. He is the mirror, Jesus Christ is the mirror in which we discover who the creator really is. He is the one through whom all things were made and through whom by his death and resurrection, all things are now being remade, reclaimed from the power of death. Paul is claiming for Jesus Christ what the ancient Jewish wisdom writers claimed for the figure of wisdom, the wisdom by which the world was made, the wisdom you need to be fully alive as a human being, the wisdom by which the living God inhabits his world and breathes into it his own warm life and brings about within it the fulfillment of his strange and beautiful purposes. And this wisdom has a human face. It is the face of the man, Jesus Christ. So those of us here who love Jesus and who seek to follow him and serve him, those of us who treat him as the star by which we sail, are called to be agents of this new creation. And so we're called to be agents of divine wisdom. And so I think we should remember this poem we heard in Colossians, this vision of wisdom. In the decisions we make as Christians, we should choose wisely. And that's difficult sometimes. It's difficult. I'll give you a very practical example. Supposing sometimes you find church a little bit boring. What should you do? Should you just change church? Or maybe try and radically change the church? But imagine you had a spiritual director, someone to go and talk about your spiritual life with. And he told her about this feeling you've been having. They might share the wisdom of St. John of the Cross, who was a Spanish saint who lived in the 1500s, one of the great teachers of the spiritual life, the wisest teachers. He compared Christians who need those warm and exciting feelings to infants who want to be held and regard their parents with a kind of self-centered love for what mum and dad can do for them. In response to this temptation, St. John talked in a well-known phrase about the dark night, the dark night of the soul, the dark night, when God withdraws the warm feelings we might have once had, supportive feelings, from us, so we can begin to love him more than we love feelings of being close to him. We love him instead of just the feelings we have. St. John of the Cross describes how God takes us maybe out of his arms, places us on our feet, and asks us to walk beside him, stops carrying us, we can grow through this dark night. We can grow up and learn to deal with our boredom. That's the wisdom of John of the Cross. Or, to take another pressing example, how as a church should we deal wisely, should we respond wisely to our anxieties about our future? These anxieties are perfectly understandable. The Church of England is 
dying fast. That's what the papers say. We need to act. <clears throat> we need to do something. What should we do? But it might be also wise for us to remember that the way we can make ourselves attractive to others is by being fully ourselves, having confidence in what we are, even if that's a little strange and different. I remember the first sermon I think I preached here, I talked about a wonderful t-shirt that the Methodist Society in Cambridge University used to have. John Wesley, the founder of Methodism, um, talked about being strangely warmed by an experience of the Holy Spirit he had. And they put on their t-shirts, the Methodist Society, warmly strange. Maybe it's okay to be warmly strange. You know, have confidence in who you are, who we are as Christians, even though that's a little strange and different. Maybe you remember from when you were courting, not so long ago perhaps, that it's when we stop constantly worrying about attracting people that we might actually become more attractive to them. But also in the end, the church is not just called to be successful. There are lots of things that we are doing and should do more to grow younger, more diverse as a congregation, full steam ahead. But the church is also, of course, you know, called to be faithful as well as successful. And to be honest, if it came to it, and I hope it never will, in the end I prefer for us to die with dignity if that's what it requires to be faithful to our calling, like the martyrs, like the saints, rather than to forget who we are by being, trying to be superficially attractive, if that means compromising or abandoning the faith as we have understood it, as it's been given to us. You know, a priest is called to guard the deposit of the faith. That's what Christians are called to do. Indeed, the Bible's full of stories of a faithful remnant. Maybe that's God's will for us, to be a faithful remnant in this time and place. In biblical theology, the remnant is those faithful people that survive some catastrophe, something like the exile in Babylon. You remember, here and now, this remnant maybe is made up of the people who still come to this church and faithfully say their prayers, people of true devotion. You are the beating heart of this parish. You know, Eleanor Rigby and Father Mackenzie in the Beatles song, All the Lonely People, these are my heroes, can feel lonely being a Christian these days, especially if you're under 50. Can feel lonely being a Christian, whatever your age. So you, here this morning, are my heroes and heroines. I believe that you could be our most effective evangelists. Secularization has indeed been a catastrophe for the churches. Some people say that to be entirely modern is to believe in nothing. But I think that if we're going to look to our North Star as we navigate through this storm and make wise decisions, then we must be more of what we have been called to be. More thoughtful, more prayerful, less fearful, more obedient to God's call. We need to have more, not less, to share with others if we're going to convert them. And we are a resurrection people after all. Institutional death isn't the end should hold out no terror for the faithful. And it will only be this lack of fear, I think, that can make us attractive once again and convert the world by turning the hearts of the disobedient to the wisdom of the just, which is the wisdom of Jesus Christ, the firstborn over all creation and the head of the church. Amen. <clears throat>